Hi, I'm Ben with uh, Grace Community Church. I'm one of the pastors here, and I wanted to thank you for watching this sermon. I pray that it serves you well, that it will help you grow in your understanding of God's Word, the Bible, that it will deepen your love for Christ and help you to pursue holiness in your own life. And we are glad that you're here watching this video, but uh, we, we also pray that this video would not be a, a replacement for your own local church and sitting under the preaching and teaching of your own pastor. But we do pray that it, it helps you, that it edifies you. If you have any questions about this sermon or our church in general, feel free to visit our website, gracecommunitychurchberea.com, and hit the Contact Us button. We'll be happy to help you in any way that we can. And may God be glorified through your listening to this sermon. Andrew Murray, a Scottish pastor of the 19th century, said, the world asks, what does a man own? Christ asks, how does he use it? This morning, we're going to talk about something that I rarely talk about, and that is the subject of money. You could come here for a year and not hear much from the pulpit about money. That is to put people's fears at rest that Oh, no, it's going to be a big fest. No, it's not a big fest. It is an opportunity uh, for me to teach you from the scriptures what the Bible says about giving as a Christian. How we use money is important to us because it is an element of our sanctification as well as our discipleship. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to examine uh, several principles that are spelled out for us here by the Apostle Paul in the 8th chapter of 2 Corinthians. Now, before I get into the text, you may be surprised to learn just how much the Bible has to say about money. John MacArthur uh, gives these uh, facts, if you will, I guess. He's at 16 of the 38 parables of Jesus deal with money. One out of ten verses in the New Testament deals with that subject. Scripture offers about 500 verses on prayer, fewer than 500 on faith, and over 2,000 on money. The believer's attitude toward money and possessions is determinative. So to recap, again, 16 of the Lord's 38 parables had to deal with money and possessions, Nearly a quarter or 25% of the words of Jesus, in, uh, of, of Jesus' words in the New Testament deal with biblical stewardship. One out of every 10 verses in the Gospels deal with the subject of money. And again, there are more than 2,000 scriptures on giving money and possessions in the Bible, which is twice as many as faith and prayer combined. So what do we conclude from that? Well, in light of what the Bible has to say about money, it's, imp it's imperative that we understand what the Bible teaches about the Christian's relationship to money. So let me begin with just some basic facts of what the Bible teaches uh, about the broader topic of stewardship, if you will, before we look specifically at giving. First of all, this is not a, going to be a new fact to many, if any, of us. But the Bible teaches that everything belongs to God, therefore nothing belongs to us. Everything belongs to God, therefore nothing belongs to us. Job 41, God is speaking, Who has first given to me that I should, obey, that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. Then in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those that dwell therein. So it's, that's, those are just a couple of the examples that we could look at in Scripture that clearly tell us that everything belongs to God. But God, in His grace, provides you and I with the ability to make money, to earn money. Because he gives, the, gives us that ability, he expects us to be a good steward of the funds that he ha allows us to earn. 
Here's a second basic Bible truth. Every Christian is to give back a portion of what God has blessed them with. Every Christian is to give back a portion of what God has blessed them with. Let me read to you Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. I'll just read the first part of the verse. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. Now, the reason I use that verse is because Jesus is making an assumption that every Christian is going to give. He says, when you give. He doesn't say, if you give. He says, when you give. So he makes the assumption that every Christian is going to be a giver. He just assumed that it was going to be, that it is, a normal part of the Christian life. Later in the same chapter, down in verses 19 through 21, Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So how do we lay up treasure in heaven? Well, one of the ways is when we give back part of that which God has given to us. Now, I'd like you to turn to Mark chapter 12. I want, I want to read a passage in Mark chapter 12 and make a brief comment from it. Mark chapter 12, and we'll begin reading in verse 41. Mark 12, 41, and he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting uh, money into the offering box. And we're talking, this is referring to Jesus here. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came out and put in two small, two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. I could say something about the rich and the amount that they give, that they gave. But I want to focus on what Jesus says about, on, about the widow. He doesn't commend the rich for what they gave. And I think the reason is because they, their, their giving wasn't proportional as it should have been. They gave out of their abundance, not according to their abundance. But here we have this poor widow lady who puts in these two small copper coins, which amounted to what Jesus describes as a penny, and he commends her for giving all that she had. She gave generously and she gave sacrificially. Now, there would be some today who would say what the widow lady did was foolish. How could she give? give what little she gave if it was all that she had. There are those who would say that is foolish. Well, not according to Jesus. Jesus commended her for giving really according to and really above her ability. Now, we'll see why as we work our way through the message this morning, why he commended her. Uh, what I want to highlight here is that no one can say that they are too poor to give. No one can say that. Jesus didn't rush over to the offering box and said, hold it, fellas. I got to get this money back for her. No. No. He commended her. And again, we'll see why as we move forward. The point is, lots of times, it's not unusual for people to say, well, when I make X amount, whenever, whatever that magic number is, when I make that amount, then I'll start giving. The problem is you can't find that rationale in the scriptures. If Jesus commended this poor widow lady for giving even a small amount then nobody else has an excuse for not giving if they don't have whatever amount they think that they need to have before they give. 
Um, one more principle concerning money. Money is used by the Lord as a means of discipleship. Money is used by the Lord as a means of discipleship. Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So it's an element of discipleship. Luke 12, 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Luke 16, verses 11 and 12. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you the true riches? And if, and if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? So repeatedly we see here that Jesus is addressing the issue of stewardship in the life of every believer. And again, we could look at other examples, but I think that will suffice for this morning. So what are God's principles of giving? What are God's principles of giving? Well, from our text this morning here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Apostle Paul gives us eight different principles that apply to us as Christians as we consider this subject of giving. So I'm going to try and phrase them in, in much the same way to try and keep some kind of flow. Obviously, with eight principles, I can't say much about them, for which some of you are saying hallelujah, uh, but I'll try and give enough uh, to, to, for them to make sense. And honestly, um, each one of these principles could be a standalone message in, in itself, but it won't be today. Principle number one, because you are a Christian, your giving should flow from the grace you've received. Because you are a Christian, your giving should flow from the grace that you have received. Look at verses 1 and 2 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Now notice that Paul makes a direct connection between the grace that they had been given and their display of generosity. Their giving was motivated by their experience of God's gracious working in their lives. What is the basis for your giving as a Christian? It is not the law, it is grace. Can I say that again? The basis for your giving as a Christian is not the law, it is grace. Your giving is not a matter of your philanthropy. It should be motivated by God's lavish grace that every believer has been a recipient of. God's grace enables us. God's grace empowers us to do what we normally wouldn't do apart from God's work of grace in our lives. Apart from God's grace at work in our lives, apart from our salvation, we are naturally selfish people. We want to get all that we can, put it all in a can, and then sit on a can. We're not normally people who like to be generous and share. But when God does a work of grace in our hearts, guess what? He changes our hearts, and part of that heart change is that upon our recognition of the magnitude of what he has done for us, we give out of his work of grace in our lives. We can say it this way, the giving of grace empowers the desire and the grace to give. The giving of grace empowers the desire and the grace to give. The giving by the believers in the churches of Macedonia was a visible demonstration that they had indeed been touched by God's grace. This is where Paul starts. He makes it very clear. It was because of God's grace that they gave what they gave and how they gave. Your giving is you making known that you have been given grace. Therefore, if you struggle with giving, don't take that lightly. 
You need to ask yourself, have I truly been touched by grace? Because when we receive the grace of God, and we recognize the magnitude of what he has done for us, how can we keep it to ourselves and not be willing to give and share with others? Your giving, your generosity is your recognition and your appreciation of the work of God in your life. Principle number two, because you are a Christian, your giving reveals your faith, reveals if your faith is either growing or stagnant. Because you are a Christian, your giving reveals whether or not your faith is growing or if it is stagnant. Look at verses 2 and 3. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. Now we have to understand something of the backdrop here in the context. Now Paul is writing this to the believers in the church at Corinth. And these believers had promised a year ago that they would take up an offering, that they would uh, have a collection together that would be sent on to the suffering and persecuted saints in Jerusalem. And he uses the believers in the churches of Macedonia as an example of generous giving. Now, it's important to note that the churches of Macedonia were undergoing severe persecution. Paul refers to their severe affliction. What is being tested in the Macedonians? Their faith. Their faith. Correct? God always tests our faith. Every believer who's ever lived or ever will live will find their faith tested. And so part of their testing was this affliction that they were going through. And the Bible is clear that our faith as believers will be tested. And Paul, again, describes their, their testing as severe. Now, this region of Macedonia was part of the ancient uh, kingdom of Alexander the Great. But now it was a war-torn uh, region that had been plundered by the Romans. And the persecution that Paul describes that they were suffering meant that many of them didn't have any employment. They had lost the means of providing for their families and providing the basic needs of life. Yet despite their affliction, despite their deep poverty, they gladly, they willingly, they generously gave. You say, well, how does this relate to a growing faith? Well, ask yourself, if you found yourself in a similar situation, would you give? If you, lo if you lost your job tomorrow, would you give next week? That's what they did. Say, so how could they do that? Because they had a growing faith. They realized what God had done in their lives. They realized that God had already solved their biggest problem and met their greatest need, which was their need for salvation. They understood that. Therefore, when it came to giving, because of their recognition of what God had already done, the faith they had in God because of what he had done, they could give generously and sacrificially because they trusted him. They had faith that he would provide for them whatever their physical needs may be. Okay. Many times as Christians, we simply have to trust the Lord that he's going to be true to his word. But my God will supply all your needs. Either you believe it or you don't. 
And how do you prove that you believe it? You give as the need arises, trusting him to take care of you. Principle number three, because you are a Christian, your giving should be generous. Principle number three, because you are a Christian, your giving should be generous. Look at verse two again. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Now, you talk about a verse that seems like it just is so incongruent. I mean, notice what he says here. Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Extremely poor, yet extremely generous. You know, our church covenant that every member commits to says that they agree to give generously to, to support the ministry of the church. Say, well, what does it mean to give generously? Well, to give generously means that you give liberally. It means that you give happily. It's a picture of open-handed giving. In other words, you're not tenaciously clinging on to it. You're not a begrudging giver. Because of grace, you're glad to go above the minimum. And that's exactly what the poor believers in the church of Macedonia did. Look at verse 3. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. See, the generosity meant that they were also giving sacrificially. And again, we have to say, how could they do that? Why did they do that? How could they give generously? How could they give sacrificially? Because they had a growing faith. Because they believed that the Lord would provide for their needs. Why did they give generously? Why did they give sacrificially? Because God had already lavished the riches of his grace on them. See, grace goes beyond the law. And what I mean by that is many Christians' de default setting is to give as little as they can to meet some kind of supposed minimum, like God's got a minimum standard wage. And I'll give up to that, but no more. That wasn't these people. They went above. They went ab uh, uh, above and beyond. And beloved, this really is a call for our own self-examination to examine our, our giving and see if we are liberal in our giving. Are we generous in our giving? Do we give sacrificially? Let me ask you a question. Does your giving impact your lifestyle? That's what it means to give sacrificially. Does your giving impact your lifestyle? Principle number four, because you are a Christian, you should be eager to give. Because you are a Christian, you should be eager to give. Look at verse four. Begging us earnestly. Why? For the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. <laughs> Try and see this from the Macedonian's point of view. They were poor. They were broke. They needed relief. But yet when they heard of the need of their brothers and sisters in Christ in Jerusalem, Paul says they begged us to allow them to participate. Isn't that a rare attitude? They begged Paul to let them take part in it. As I read that verse to study this chapter this week, I couldn't help but think of the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness and God had given instruction to Moses to build the tabernacle. And the craftsmen who were building the tabernacle came to Moses and said, this is my paraphrase, you got to tell them to stop. They keep bringing stuff to us, and we have more than enough to complete the job. So Moses sent out a proclamation throughout the camp. 
We've got enough. Thank you. Isn't that amazing? They were so eager to give. They gave an abundance and so that the craftsman said, we've got more than enough. Thank you. And so the children of Israel here in the wilderness, they, they were just like the believers in Macedonia. They were eager to give. They were begging to give. They went above and beyond in their giving. You know, I was thinking about Ananias and Sapphira. The believers of Macedonia were just the opposite of those two. You remember their story. They pretended to be eager to give, and they pretended that they were giving generously when, in fact, it wasn't true. Say, Principle number five, because you are a Christian, your giving is an act of worship. Because you are a Christian, your giving is an act of worship. Look at verse five. And this, not as we expected, but gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Now, the word first there doesn't mean refer to a unit of measurement. Rather, it means to first in priority. The priority of their lives was to first give themselves to the Lord. That's where all giving begins. Have you given yourself to the Lord? Have you given yourself to Christ? That's the most important giving that you can participate in. They first gave themselves to the Lord. And once they had given themselves to the Lord, it was natural for them to give out of their resources, regardless of how small they may have been, it was just natural for them to give back to the Lord's work. It is the believer's supreme act of worship to give themselves unreservedly and repeatedly to the Lord. Romans 12, 1, we, most of us could probably quote part of it. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to do what? To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's what God desires. That's what pleases God, is to first give yourself to the Lord. And then the giving from your resources that he has provided to you will come naturally to you. And again, I'll say this. I say this with kindness and I say this with love. If you struggle with giving, have you given yourself to the Lord? Have you given yourself to the Lord? Principle number six, because you are a Christian, you should excel in the grace of giving. Because you are a Christian, you should excel in the grace of giving. Here, in, Look at what Paul writes in verse seven. But as you excel in everything... In faith, now he's writing to the Corinthians, as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge, in all earnestness and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. So Paul compliments them on the work of grace that he sees in their lives. Now this word excel means to abound. It means to have an overabundance. So he compliments them for their faith. He compliments them for their speech. He compliments them for their excelling in knowledge and in earnestness. But there's one more thing that he wants to make sure that they are excelling in. What is it? He wants them to excel in the grace of giving. Again, he makes a direct connection between the grace they have received and their giving. Principle number seven, because you are a Christian, your giving demonstrates the love of God that has been shed abroad in your heart. Because you are a Christian, your giving demonstrates the love of God that has been shed abroad in your heart. Look at verse eight. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. See, our love, we can, we can say that we love all that we want, but until our love is turned into some kind of tangible action, I don't really know if you love me or not. Correct? Every pastor has had the sad experience of someone saying, I love you, while, they, while you think they're patting you on the back, they're stabbing you in the back. Do they really love me? Nah, baby, nah. Because their actions spoke louder than their words. And one of the ways that we 
demonstrate our love for God, and one of the ways we demonstrate our love for others is through our giving. Do we give generously? Do we give sacrificially? Now, here's something that I think we need to take note of. Paul did not command them to give, although he had every right to. After all, he was an apostle, but he didn't throw his weight around and say, I say to you because I'm an apostle, you must give. Oh, he, he doesn't say that. He, in fact, he, he goes out of his way. I say this not as a command, but to prove the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. See, if you give only because you're commanded to give, are you giving out of love? Probably not. But when you give in this fashion, it proves your love. And it proves your love not only for the Lord, but for the Lord's people as well. You know, the Christian's love, it's not a love of duty. It's, it's a love of gratitude that, that overflows from the recognition of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. That's where our love comes from. We, we love in recognition that the debt that our sin had created has been paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we love. What's the, the old uh, song say? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. It's the right attitude. There's, a, there's an example of forgiveness and love in Luke chapter 7. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus is invited to the home of a Pharisee to have dinner. Jesus goes. During the course of the evening, a woman shows up, which Luke describes as a woman of the city, a sinner. And what does this woman do? Well, she weeps at the feet of Jesus. She literally washes the feet of Jesus with her tears. And she dries the feet of Jesus with her own hair. And then she took this alabaster container of ointment and poured it out on the feet of Jesus. Now, at this point, the Pharisee does what a Pharisee does. Luke says he began to talk to himself. He probably mum mumbling under his breath, something like, doesn't he know who this lady is? Doesn't he know how she makes her living? Jesus, how, how could you not know this well Jesus did know it Jesus also knew what the Pharisee was thinking because he turns to the Pharisee and says a certain money lender had two debtors one owed 500 denarii and the other 50 when they could not pay he canceled the debt of both now which of them will love him more Simon answered the Pharisee the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt and he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil. But she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. See, our God is a giving God. Why does God delight to give good gifts to his children? Because he loves them. For God so loved the world that he did what? That he gave. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, gave his precious blood for our redemption. We are saved to be made like Christ, correct? 
Therefore, it is a contradiction in terms for a Christian who professes to love God to not give. In fact, it would be unnatural. It would be going against our nature for a Christian to not be a generous sacrificial giver. When we realize the magnitude of the debt that we owed and the fact that Christ has forgiven us that debt when we come to him in repentance and faith, well, it changes everything about us. And though we may not have the opportunity to do as this woman did, but we have the opportunity every week to come and express our love, our recognition of what he has done by our giving. Principle number eight, because you are a Christian, your giving should be proportional to your resources. Because you are a Christian, your giving should be proportional to your resources. Look at verse 12. For if the readiness is there, now notice it starts with attitude. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Not all, not all the believers in Macedonia were on the same level economically. Though most of them, perhaps all of them were poor, still some had more than others. And Paul clearly states that they gave according to what they had, not what they didn't have. Here's the point. God does not expect you to give what you don't have. He does ask and expect that your giving is proportional to your ability. Okay? For instance, I use the example of empty nesters, and since Sherry and I are the only empty nesters around, I have to start practicing what I preach, amen? Someone who finds themselves in such a situation as Sherry and I do could give and probably should give more than a young family raising their children. Why? Because we can give out of what we have. And that young family raising their children, they have other financial obligations and needs. They don't have as much, what's the term they use, disposable income. Okay. So our giving should be proportional to what we have. Likewise, a young professional with no children should proportionally give more than a family of six or eight kids. A single person with no family responsibilities should proportionally give more than others who have more financial responsibilities. See, the believers in Macedonia gave in proportion to what they had, but still their proportion contained an element of sacrificial giving. That's the point Paul's making. And we have to go, we look at these believers in Macedonia, they're, they're dirt poor, to put it in the modern vernacular. They're dirt poor. But yet they're generous and they're given sacrificially. And we ask ourselves, how could they do this? And it goes back to, again because they believed God, because they trusted God, because they believed Philippians 4, 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now, beloved, you have to have to come to the point in your life where you say, regardless of what happens, I'm going to trust the Lord. And one of the hardest areas in our lives to trust the Lord is with our finances. Why? Because money represents what? Security. So it's one of the great tests of our faith when we obey what the Bible says about giving and giving proportionally. Now, the, the point is, there are some who either because of God's blessing or their station in life who can give more than others. And God is okay with that. Now, I might, as well get the, I might as well get the elephant in the room out of the way. You've not mentioned a word about tithing. 
I may shock you, and don't get mad at me. Search the scriptures. I believe the New Testament goes beyond tithing to grace giving. I do think, and this is my opinion, this is my opinion, and this is what Sherry and I have always practiced. We've always given, well, frankly, more than 10%. We've not tried to be legalistic in our giving at all, at all. We don't calculate it down to the last penny. No, we give... We try and give generously. We try and give sacrificially. Search the scriptures and see whether these things are true. Now, don't get mad at me. Please don't get mad at me. <laughs> Search the scriptures. I think many Christians use 10% as a crutch, as an excuse. When they, and here's what I mean by that. When they have the ability to give more, they say, well, all God requires is my 10%. Read the New Testament. Read the New Testament. You say, don't you feel like you're, you're setting yourself up for failure here? No. If I preach the truth, if I preach what the Bible says, I trust God that he's going to meet our needs. Okay. So it should be given, your giving should be proportional. Now, we're going into overtime. I'm giving you a bonus principle. Principle number nine. The reason I didn't include it in the eighth is because it's found in the next chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Principle number nine. Because you are a Christian, your giving should be done cheerfully. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. The point is this, Paul says, Whoever sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, my pastor used to say, if you can't give cheerfully, don't give at all. I don't think that's what the Bible says. I think that's encouraging people's disobedience. The point Paul is making is, based upon everything that God has done for you, based upon the work of grace in your life, based upon what God's doing right here, right now, what he's promised to do for you, you should be able to give cheerfully, not begrudgingly, cheerfully. So what does God love? He loves a cheerful giver. Cheerful means happy. It means a joyful giver. Now, I'm sure that you've seen... Uh, the movie A Christmas Carol, and depending on which uh, version you've, you've seen or perhaps you've read the book, uh, the version that I like is the one with um, uh, the guy that played uh, Jean-Luc in Star Trek. What's his name? Patrick Stewart. Stewart. Patrick Stewart. Yeah, the bald-headed guy. In, in that version that they made years ago, you know, of course, you know, they, they take uh, old uh, Scrooge back through his childhood and all that stuff. And one of the stops is, is at a place where Scrooge worked when he, was, when he was a young intern, if you will. And they show that they, they close up shop. It's, it's Christmas Eve, and they're going to throw a big party. Now, uh, I, I'll buy you lunch if you can name the, the name of the man who threw the party. Oh, you got it. You got it. Mr. Fezziwig. <laughs> Mr. Fezziwig. He was a joyful giver. He wanted to throw that party. He wanted to reward his employees that night. The question is, are you a Fezziwig or are you a Scrooge? Do you give cheerfully or do you give begrudgingly? Notice one final thing. Paul, an apostle of Christ, outside of the Lord Jesus, the greatest theologian this world has ever known, 
He makes a promise that we must take at face value. Look at verse 6 again. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. No one could ever accuse Paul of being a health, wealth, and prosperity preacher. But he clearly states a biblical principle that if you sow sparingly, if you don't give proportionally, generously, sacrificially, well, you can expect a minimum return or minimal return on what you give. But on the other hand, if you sow bountifully, you will also reap bountifully. And I encourage you to go read the context in which Paul said that, and you'll see that it is still in the context when he's talking about giving. Paul is not using this as a tool of manipulation, nor is it some kind of pseudo-motivation. Rather, he is stating a biblical reality. You don't give to get, which is what the health, wealth, and prosperity preachers would have us to believe. You don't give to get, but when you give, you get. Sherry and I can honestly say that we've been in the ministry now for 30 plus years. God has met every one of our needs, always. And I'm confident that he will continue to do that. I don't, I, I really, I don't like to hold myself up as some kind of an example. I really don't. But I, I do want you to, I do want you to take it, take the word of somebody who's been in this a long time. God has never failed us. God has never let us down. There have been some lean, lean times? Absolutely. Been some hard times? Absolutely. But he's never failed us. You don't give to get, but when you give, you get. Would you take my word for that's true? So well, you're, you're, you're not rich. You're driving a 2000 lawyer, uh, a Toyota pickup truck, and you got to crank the handles down. I didn't say you give to get rich. You give, and when you give, you get exactly what you need. Exactly what you need. For the younger people, do not be afraid to give. You'll be much better off in the long run. So what if you struggle with giving? Look at verse 8 of 2 Corinthians 9. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. You see what Paul's saying there? I, th I think he has in mind those who were tempted to sow sparingly. He says, if, if that's you, if you struggle with giving, I want you to know something. That just as God can work in other areas of your life, he can increase your faith, he can increase your holiness, he can make you more like Christ, he can also help you in this area of giving. Okay? Giving is a grace that God wants us to abound in, and whatever God desires for us, he will help us achieve that desire. Here we go. Because you are a Christian, your giving as a Christian should be, number one, driven by grace. Number two, driven by faith. Number three, generous. Number four, eager. 
Number five, an act of worship. Number six, we should excel in it. Number seven, a demonstration of our love. Number eight, proportional to our resources. Number nine, done cheerfully. And then number 10, promise driven. Those are God's principles for giving. Listen, I encourage you. I would love it for you to go home and read and study 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Fix these truths in your mind. We've all heard this saying, but it's so true. You can't outgive God. Now, I, I'm, careful, I'm careful to use this because I, I know it's given in the, in the Old Testament context of tithing. But in Malachi 3.10, there's only, there's only one instance in the Bible where God said, test me. And that's in Malachi 3.10. You know what it had to do with? They're giving. They're giving. Say, don't be afraid to be obedient in this area. 